Okay, everybody, welcome to the new reality. Um, these are the videos I'm going to be posting, and hopefully, uh, everything's going to be just like normal except just uh, asynchronous and uh, different places. Um, so, if there's any content here that you don't understand or you got questions, just email them to me until things get back to normal. All right, so um, we've talked a, a lot about uh, anatomy and physiology. Um, and we've we've discussed um, vocalizations and the the vocalizations remember one of the big factors w was uh, male male competition and uh, attracting females um, and so that kind of leads us into mating systems so to understand the different approaches that males and females take to uh, gaining reproductive success um, we need to first see that they really do have the same goals. So they have the same uh, evolutionary goal um, to maximize their fitness. And remember in evolution the, the term fitness refers to how many copies of your genes you're passing on to the next generation. And, and so they're both trying to do that. But they both have very different tactics typically in uh, achieving this goal. And so this is one of the driving factors that leads to sexual dimorphism and sexual dichromatism um, in, between males and females and different behaviors associated with the different tactics that they're using to try to maximize this evolutionary goal. So the same goal, but they have different tactics to achieve that goal between males and females. All right, so why is this? Well, uh, again, it's... Um, I think I, I mentioned this previously a little bit uh, when we talked about um, the gametes. Um, males have really small gametes. They can produce lots and lots of them. They're generally not sperm limited. Females, on the other hand, are producing these very large uh, gametes and uh, they are limited in the number that, of those that they can produce. So we call this an isogamy, uh, which simply means different sized gametes. So again, this is the typical situation for males. Remember, there's some difference in morphology between uh, most passerines and non-passerines. Um, but, but regardless, they're all very small. Males can produce billions of them, and each one represents a very small investment. And so we're going to see that this drives them to um, not really caring if they have a particular mating option, what the quality of the female is. I mean, sperm are cheap doesn't matter just go ahead and mate with that female you're not really losing out anything females on the other hand again are producing these very large gametes and they uh, don't have very many of them and each one is this very large investment so uh, in contrast to the males they don't want to just mate with any old male they want to make sure that 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 those few eggs that they have are being fertilized by the highest quality uh, male in the population So, males tend to have really high reproductive potential to achieve their goal of maximizing their fitness or, or maximizing their reproductive success. They generally are not sperm limited. A single male, if he can control access to females or convince lots of females to mate with him, can mate with lots of females in the population. So the male tactic, typically, uh, to maximize this evolutionary goal again, is to mate with as many females as possible. Uh, fertilize the maximum number of ova possible to maximize that evolutionary goal. So this means males tend to not be, be very choosy with regard to uh, the mates that they, they choose. Again, sperm is cheap. They can make lots of it. Um, if they have a female that's willing to mate, even if she's maybe lower quality and the probability that she'll be successful at raising his young is low, it's better than nothing. I mean, he's it, it literally, remember the copulation it takes uh, usually just a couple of seconds. And again, he's got plenty of sperm, so there's really nothing to lose there. So to, to maximize the number of females that he can go after, um, he needs to be very dominant to other males so that he can have exclusive access uh, to uh, most of the females in the population. Or if that's not possible, in some species, dominance isn't the, the driving factor determining uh, how many females you mate with. 
it's more associated with female choice. And so you want to make sure that, that uh, you as a male can convince the females that you're the higher quality individual compared to other males in the population. So we'll see that those are two different tactics. Sometimes they can work in, in, uh, in tandem. So just to summarize the male situation, we're going to talk about this like in the two cues. Males are going after quantity. The more females they can mate with, the better. Females, on the other hand, the other cue that they're going after is quality. Females are going to be very choosy because of their eggs are costly. They have a limited supply of them. Um, so their reproductive success is not driven by quantity as much, but by the quality of the offspring that they can produce, which in large part has to do with the quality of the male they choose to mate with. So females only want to mate with the highest quality males that are available. This gives them the best genes, uh, basically, and in some cases, access to better resources, higher quality territories, maybe uh, better defense of the nest against predators if, you, if you're talking about a higher quality male. And we'll see that in most birds, biparental care is, is one of the driving forces in their evolution as far as reproduction goes. And so mating with a high quality male may allow you to have a, a better co-parent uh, in that process. So all of these things give that female the her offspring the best chance of survival and subsequent reproduction. So you want to mate with, you know, say a higher quality male like this bright um, peacock versus a smaller, maybe less bright uh, individual. And we'll talk about why some of those types of traits um, are, are the things that the female will be paying attention to when she's trying to assess uh, male quality. So this, uh, again, this, these differences in tactics lead to differences in, in male and female behavior and morphology. And the process by which these differences have evolved is, is a, a type of selection analogous in some ways to the way natural selection works, but it's called sexual selection. So these are traits that are adaptive in the sense that they increase mating success of the male and the female. We can break sexual selection into two classes. One is uh, more generally referred to as intrasexual selection. So um, it's typically associated with competition between individuals of one sex, and that typically is males. And so oftentimes you'll simply hear this referred to as male-male competition. And this can be either direct fighting between individuals of the same sex, and so we see the evolution of weapons like this spur, on this chicken, or just generally big body size and high testosterone for, for more aggression. There's also, we'll see, um, indirect male-male competition that's typically referred to as sperm competition. Another form of sexual selection is intersexual selection, or uh, oftentimes just referred to as female choice. So in some cases, males may not be able to dominate other males and keep the, the uh, uh, females to mate just between themselves. And what's driving male success is who the female chooses to mate with. And so this is when we tend to see males evolving these really gaudy, showy displays um, like this trogon here, the bright colorations, um, sometimes very elaborate songs, very energetic dances. These are all traits that help to convince females that a, a male is healthy, uh, genetically superior, um, and just in general a quality individual. All right, so let's start off with intrasexual selection. Again, this is generally referred to as male-male competition. Um, and this is the easier one really to understand of the, the two types of sexual selection. So the first is direct male-male competition. And this is literally where we just have combats to establish dominance. So that the dominant male tends to mate with more of the females in the population. And so there can be strong uh, selection pressure in intrasexual selection to be the biggest and the baddest. Um, but that can also link to uh, signals of dominance. 
So songs, energetic displays, colors that will indicate to other males, ooh, that, that male's a dominant male. I don't want to fight that male. I'm more likely to, to, to get injured in that situation, and I'm not going to be successful. And so in social species, these signals of dominance uh, are important in, in making sure that dominance hierarchies can be set up so that there isn't the, the need for constant fighting. But fighting does occur at least uh, when we get these uh, dominance hierarchies uh, set up initially. There can be some challenges, uh, as what is shown here in this, this picture of these um, lecking birds, water uh, um, uh, kind of sandpiper birds called uh, rough. And this is where we see the evolution of weapons like spurs or just general uh, large body size, greater aggression. Um, and so when we talk about these differences in between males and females, we call this uh, sexual dimorphism. And if it's just size, it's sexual size dimorphism. If it's coloration, we call that sexual dichromatism. So that's pretty easy to understand, the direct male-male competition. Indirect male-male uh, competition involves cases where a, fem where a male can't physically, um, say, guard a, a harem of females. He can't control the other males' access to these females. So the females in these situations will be mating with multiple males. Well, is there something a male can do in, in those situations to increase the chance that, again, they will father more of, of the young coming uh, out of, of uh, the nest of those females? So this generally refer the, the way that this works is through what's called sperm competition. So the ma if a male knows that other males are mating with that female and fertilization is kind of like a lottery system, um, the more sperm that you can put into that female, the more times that you can mate with that female, the more chances you have of fertilizing more of her eggs. So this leads to the evolution of large testes to produce more sperm than competing males. Um, the evolution of killer sperm in some cases where some of the sper spermatozoa of a male will attack foreign uh, sperm. So uh, these, these, this is why it's called indirect competition. The males themselves are not fighting but their sperm are fighting, or they're, they're just in a competition with regard to uh, the quantity of sperm in uh, maximizing their chances of, of gaining fitness with that female. Another thing you can do is uh, maybe try to remove competing sperm from other males. And so this dunnock here, these are also called hedge sparrows in England, the male, uh, if he's gone out of his territory and he comes back and his female, which they're monogamous, but they have a lot of extra pair copulations, which we'll talk about later, which leads to lots of potential sperm competition. If he thinks that she's mated with another male, he'll peck her cloaca, and this causes the female to eject any rival sperm that's there, and then he mates with her again. So it's just reducing the competition uh, of sperm from, from other males by and, and then increasing the chance that, that you are putting more of your sperm inside her reproductive tract. The other thing you can do is mate guard. So during the time period uh, when your female is, is fertile or a, f a group of females potentially, trying to spend as much time with that, that female as possible and just prevent uh, sneaker males from mating with your mate. Um, so this is, is kind of like a direct male-male competition, but it's, it's more just uh, warding off that, those potential sneaky uh, copulators. Now, obviously, this has a cost associated with it if you're a male. If you're going after quantity, well, maybe you should be traveling around the neighborhood trying to get extra pair copulations with other females. But if you do that, then other males may be mating with your female. So the more time you spend guarding your female, the less chance that she will have uh, extra pair fertilizations with other males, but you as a male may not be getting as, as many uh, as well. And so that's what this graph here is showing with the, the Seychelles warbler. Um, um, with, with greater competition of, of more neighboring males, the males spend more time guarding um, and less time searching for other extra pair copulations, but also less time doing things like foraging. 
Um, so there, there's an energetic cost associated with this as well. Uh, with the, when there are fewer com competing individuals, you don't need to guard as much, and you can spend more time foraging. And uh, also maybe traveling longer distances to try to get some uh, extra pair uh, copulations. All right, let's move on to uh, intersexual selection, which again generally we refer to as female choice. So from a female's perspective, why do you want to be choosy in which male you mate with? Well, in some cases you can get some direct benefits by mating with high quality males versus low quality males. And this can come in the form of courtship feedings, or sometimes referred to as nuptial gifts. Uh, these are food gifts that are given uh, in exchange for uh, copulations with the females. So in our studies of blue-tailed bee eaters, before copulation, the, the bee eater will um, sidle up to a female and either give her uh, a large, uh, typically butterfly or dragonfly, sometimes wasp. Uh, Hymenoptera, but usually in this population it was uh, uh, Orthopterans and Lepidopterans. And then these turn here, it could be a fish, but it, it's some kind of food gift. That's uh, a nuptial gift. And the, the bigger the prey that the male can deliver, the more frequent he can deliver these nuptial gifts. Again, that's just an indication of his quality. Higher quality males tend to be better at competing with other uh, neighboring males in the territories, uh, in, in the habitat, so that they get the higher quality territories. And so uh, a, a female that mates with a higher quality male is also uh, getting better resources, not on a per um, nuptial gift basis, but just access, regular access to higher quality uh, uh, resources on a higher quality territory. These males also tend to provide higher quality parental care, and so that's another direct benefit that the female uh, will get in her reproductive of effort. And so this would be true in uh, territorial species, monogamous species, like the uh, house finch shown up here with the brighter red individuals have higher quality territories. Um, the, the stone chat down on the bottom right, um, the, the more stones that they put at the base of their nest is an indication that they're higher quality mm -hmm. individuals and have higher quality um, uh, territories and there's been it's been shown that that they provide better parental care and that makes sense right because if if you are able to gather a bunch of rocks to to make your nest carry these heavy rocks that tells a female wow you're strong you know you you can find resources that that are needed and so when it comes time to feed our offspring, you're going to be doing that with high quality uh, uh, foods and frequent uh, trips to the nest. In red-winged blackbirds, dominant males that are, have better song and are uh, more elaborately colored and have more elaborate displays um, tend to have the highest quality resources and they tend to be polygynous. So uh, higher quality territories tend to recruit more females as indicated by this figure on the left. So there can be some direct benefits for females picking higher quality individuals as far as getting better parental care, or better resources. Uh, but in some cases we'll see when males and females mate, they just mate and that's it. And so uh, there really isn't any parental care, and there may not be any nuptial gifts. So why would a female be choosy in those situations? Well, it basically boils down to they want good genes for their offspring. So they want to make sure that, they're, that the offspring that they produce are getting the best genetic combinations for the, the adaptive morphologies and the behaviors that will then lead them to being more successful uh, uh, in gaining fitness. Sometimes this is referred to with regard to the traits that the, the sons may have as the sexy son hypothesis. So a female that makes with a very attractive male that has high genetic quality and, and good display traits, she will be passing on the health associated with that individual, but also those attractive bright uh, features 
So if the dad's sexy, then the uh, uh, the sons will be sexy as well. But you know, more of a a, a practical genetic quality that the females may be getting by mating with these higher quality males is just genes associated with health. So um, particularly in tropical species, it's been shown that the brighter species or the species that have more energetic displays are more prone as a species to have parasites. But the individuals in those species that are the brightest that show the more energetic displays compared to males that are not as bright or kind of sluggish, the, the, the higher quality males um, are, are more active and more bright because they don't have parasites. Uh, and so that's a very important uh, guide that the females are paying attention to in those traits to make sure that they get the genes for, anti, for, for parasite resistance, so anti-parasitic genes that they can pass on to their offspring. And the, the heritability of, of those types of traits has been confirmed. Um, also, uh, inbreeding is, is not a good thing in most species of, of animals. It leads to the overexpression of deleterious recessive traits that typically are not a problem if you're, if you're outbred. Um, and so by choosing among traits that, that um, may be different from family members um, that, that indicate that there's, it's not kin that you're mating with, um, there can be the avoidance of inbreeding. Uh, so some other indirect genetic benefits of making sure that you're, you're mating with an appropriate individual. So I keep talking about traits like bright coloration, uh, very active traits. Um, why, is it, why are these the types of traits that females pay attention to when they're trying to uh, judge uh, male quality? And really what it boils down to, a trait that is an honest signal of a male's ability, of his genetic health, his, his overall health, his just quality, is the traits have to be costly characters. They have to be costly to produce and maintain. Because this means that an individual can't fake it. So if you're not healthy, you're not going to be able to do an energetic display. If you're not healthy, if you're not have access, don't have a good forager and access to good food, you're not going to have bright colorations the, associated with like the carotenoids. Remember, carotenoids are dry from the diet. So those are honest signals of the difference between a high quality versus a low quality male. So that's the important thing to know. Costly characters um, produce these honest signals. That's what makes them honest. They're, they're costly to produce and maintain. And that's why um, the, the males tend to have these costly traits. Because remember, it's the females in many cases that are, are trying to judge the difference between high to low quality males. Females, on the other hand, from the male's perspective, it doesn't matter, right? So oftentimes the male would want to mate with any female willing to mate. And so she doesn't have to have these um, display traits. So and I've already told you about some of these dis display traits, um, these costly male traits. Uh, large song repertoires are, are oftentimes an honest signal of age. Um, that's been demonstrated in European starlings. The, the more song that they learn through their life, uh, it's an indication that they've lived longer. And just that in itself is, is an indication that they're quality individuals if they can live uh, a long time. Clearly, things that make it hard to move, uh, just that are energetically costly to drag around, like long uh, wing streamers and these uh, standard wing night jars. Um, that's definitely a costly trait. And so a female looks at that male and goes, I can't believe you can fly around like that. Uh, a predator hasn't picked you off. Um, that's impressive. You have to be healthy. You have to have good genes. I'll mate with you. Versus a male that doesn't have traits that are, that are as elaborate. Now, sometimes the trait that the females pay attention to can vary even within a species across populations. So in some populations, of barn swallows, long tails are a key. 
Uh, in other populations, it's bright colorations in different parts of the body. So uh, we'll talk about populations of barn swallows that sometimes, you know, again, it's the long mm -hmm. tails versus uh, this rusty uh, coloration on, on the chest is, is more important in other populations. Tails, though, are all obviously uh, a pretty common trait that has evolved uh, convergently, independently, in different species because it is a costly trait to just produce. It takes a lot of, of resources to produce a long tail, but then on a daily basis, just dragging that sucker around is also very costly, uh, particularly if it's associated with energetic displays. To, to indicate what a handicap these males uh, have actually evolved. And so this is a long-tailed widow bird and that's the male in a display flight. And it is very, I've seen these birds uh, in Africa and, and it is incredible that they can actually fly. You can tell that they are really struggling when they fly. So it's not a trait that could be faked. And this is a species that is uh, polygynous. So a male will defend a territory and attempt to um, attract multiple females to nest in his territory. And so um, there was a classic study that was produced that looked at males that had similar reproductive success in one year. The next year, those males were randomly divided up into four experimental classes. And what they did is they took one quarter of the males in this population and they chopped their tails off, okay? So these males, they're all similar sizes and they had similar sized tails to begin with and they had similar sized reproductive success in the previous year. But now we've made this relatively high quality male look not very quality, okay? So you made it look like it's kind of a wimpy bird then you took that part of the tail that you cut off and you glued it on to a, another quarter of those birds in, in the study so that you produce these super males, these elongated tails that are even longer than naturally exist in nature. And then you have two control groups. One group in which you just catch the birds, you handle them, but you don't do anything really with their tail. Another experimental control, you chop off their tail and then glue it back to keep it the approximate same length. And what this study shows, well, first of all, it shows that the control, this, there may be some experimental manipulation error here because um, the controls are not exactly the same, but they're, they're on the scale where we can still probably learn for something from this study, particularly with regard to the extreme difference in the super males versus these uh, wimpified males where you've chopped off their tail. I mean, if you look at their reproductive success, it really dropped and the males with the super tails got significantly uh, a higher reproductive success uh, compared to the other groups. So it does appear that this is a trait that the females are paying attention to and it's not that they just like long tails because these males had relatively long tails. They're looking for the longest tails that exist in the population. And now why would that be? Well because that just ex that's, is an indication of they don't want just a quality male they want the highest quality male possible so that's linked to the most extreme handicap or the most extreme trait that you see in the population okay so I've been talking about this as like there's there's uh, intra and intersexual selection in some cases they can be working at the same time so um, red collared widow birds uh, males have a conditional mating tactic. A conditional mating tactic means that the males will have different approaches in reproductive uh, their tactics depending on the condition that they find themselves in. So females prefer long tail males and so males with the really long tails um, are, are attractive and they don't have any problem mating with females. Um, male dominance as far as males male-male competition goes is determined by the intensity of the red collar that they have around their neck like this uh, individual on the right and B much uh, brighter in coloration so it's going to be dominant individual um, it'll hold a territory they tend to also have the longer tails and so um, they'll have higher quality territories 
they will be able to fight off other males and so these really are the highest quality individuals and are likely to have the most uh, intense uh, reproductive success the, the best in, uh, reproductive success these lesser males like seen in A here um, they are not going to be able to get a territory but they can still try to get some reproductive success and we call this um, making the best out of a bad job frequently in, in behavioral ecology they uh, ad adopt this um, alternative reproductive strategy and in this case they are sneakers so they'll try to float among territories and they'll try to sneak copulations with the females that are paired to other males now generally they don't have nearly the reproductive success of the dominant males again because they're they've already achieved dominance by getting the best territory so um, that that's associated with male-male competition the intrasexual selection part of this and then the intersexual selection is associated with female choice that's associated with uh, the long tails so really complex um, tactics of, bo of both males and females uh, in this one species okay now the way I've been describing sexual selection I broke down the categorization of what the tactics that females use and the tactics that males do and in most of the animal kingdom we we think that that is is pretty standard that's a pretty accurate representation of what's going on birds are different in one important respect though most birds are socially monogamous that means that there's one male and one female in a pair bond for at least one reproductive attempt so what that means is from the male perspective if he's kind of tying himself down to one female that greatly limits his options for quantity remember males in most organisms are going after quantity okay well then if you're limited in quantity like the females you should shift to the female tactic and also be uh, choosy and make sure that you're mating with the highest quality female in the population and so this tends to lead to both males and females in monogamous species being uh, choosy so if you look at the mutual displays in crested auklets they're both paying attention to the crest size and you see you don't see the extreme sexual uh, uh, dimorphism or sexual dichromatism they both have to have the display traits to convince each other to mate Gouldy and finches both males and females are bright in coloration uh, seen here on the right and uh, th they have some really complex genetic system in it they tend to show positive assortative mating by plumage pattern so that they pick individuals uh, that are like them in their head patterns barn owls both males and females pay attention to black spots on their plumage the more of those the higher quality individual and the more likely to mate with each other and so in these species all of these things like the blue throats plumage brightness the highest quality male tends to mate with the highest quality female and that we call this positive assortative mating so that the highest quality individuals are mating with each other and then the leftovers as it kind of goes down the list tend to get paired off together uh, as well so again, this is, this is typical in the, the socially monogamous birds, and that's what most uh, birds are. Okay, some other deviations. So th the reason it's really better to refer to intra and intersexual selection instead of male-male competition and female choice is sometimes it's reversed, the typical pattern sometimes males are the more choosy sex and the females are going after quantity so this is typically associated with polyandrous mating systems in which a single female mates or has a pair bond with many males oftentimes in these species the males are the ones that are that are providing all the parental care they build a nest their female lays a clutch of eggs in their nest and then it's all up to the male to take care of that so again in that situation the males are limited in quantity they want to make sure that they're mating with the highest quality female possible and so they uh, tend to to in these species the females tend to be larger the females tend to have the more exaggerated display traits 
uh, as seen here in these red-necked phalaropes. The bird on the left is the male, the duller one, and the brighter, clearly larger individual on the right is the female. So it's, in this case, we have uh, intrasexual selection. It's female-female competition. They're fighting each other constantly. They have, they're, they're very aggressive in territory defense. And then there's also male choice as not female choice. Females are displaying in their territory to try to recruit as many males into their territory as possible. And they have to convince the, fem the males sorry, of their quality. But this is pretty rare. Um, it's seen um, in just a few bird species. And actually it's pretty common in, it, it tends to be concentrated. I wouldn't say it's common, but where you do see it, you tend to see it in the shrad reforms, like the foul ropes. Okay, well, I talked about social pair bonds uh, being associated with monogamous pairs in most bird species. But again, we generally refer to these as social pair bonds. It's just that on a daily basis, you look in a territory and you see a male and a female typically paired uh, with each other, and you rarely see uh, that female with another male. But occasionally, you will see individuals sneak into their territories uh, or females sneak out of their territories into another male's territory to gain what are called extra pair copulations. So why would males and females participate in extra pair copulations? Well, the benefits of the males are pretty clear, right? Males are typically going after quantity, and if you're in a monogamous relationship, you're kind of limited in quantity anyway, so extra pair copulations is really the best way to do that. But there's a, a second advantage of that. If you're mating with just your female and your nest gets depredated, you've lost all your fitness. But if you, if you at least have some reproductive success by mating with uh, other females in the neighborhood uh, and get a, a few extra pair copulations, it's less likely that all of those nests are going to get hit by predators. So you're kind of uh, spreading out that predation jackpot risk. So what about from the female's perspective? What, what could her benefits be? Because remember, they're generally not going after quality. I mean, so quantity, they're generally going after quantity. Sorry. <laughs> Try that again. They're generally going after quality, not quantity. Well, one thing that they may be doing is trying to get some genetic diversity associated with the young in their nest. Um, or if they, again, if there, there tends to be positive assorted mating and they're a lower quality female and they're mated with, socially, a lower quality male, well, by having extra pair copulations with a neighbor who's a superior individual, you may be getting more uh, quality genes for your offspring. Sorry, I'm recording this outside so you can probably hear the uh, Carolina Rams. He's, he's pretty loud right now. Um, another potential reason why you'd want to mate with another male. Maybe your male is high genetic quality in most regards, but it just turns out that he's got one genetic problem that means he has lower fertility. And so you're, you're, you would have low fertility associated with the, the nest and your eggs. By mating outside of that, it kind of gives you an insurance policy so that you can maintain some uh, fertility in your clutch. And then sometimes mating with other males in, the, in uh, the neighborhood, in other territories, that male will grant you access to that territory so you can get those resources, or he may convince you to have that extra pair copulation by providing you a nuptial gift. That's definitely what we uh, found the bee eaters were doing. But it turns out that just because a female mates with multiple males, she may not be actually be using all of their sperm to fertilize her egg or not in the same ratio. Uh, we can only determine this by looking at, at uh, the genetics associated with the, the potential mates and the young that she actually produces. Um, so this is called cryptic female choice. It looks like the female isn't being choosy mating with multiple males, but she may be very selective in which sperm she uses. 
So, so there really is choice. It's just cryptic. It's hard for us to see. So in chickens, for example, the females, the hens will uh, mate with multiple males. They'll go ahead and let them mate with them because it sometimes can avoid um, fighting with that male um, and you know avoid potential harm and then just reject his sperm. So here in this figure, it shows you uh, the probability of sperm being rejected from low and high quality uh, males, and clearly the female is more likely to uh, retain the dominant male sperm and reject low quality sperm. So I mentioned sometimes the female may just want to mate with, with a male uh, and not, not uh, uh, resist because that can be uh, a, a potentially dangerous situation where the female could get harmed. We do see in some species forced copulations where the female is trying to exert choice but may not always be able to do so. Uh, males may be able to forcibly uh, basically rape the females. This is, tends to be fairly common in ducks uh, and the males can get so carried away fighting over mating with the female as seen in this picture right here. You can see three males that are surrounding this female who is actually underwater at this point and it has been recorded not infrequently that the males are just so um, distracted fighting each other and trying to copulate with the female that she becomes injured or uh, can even drown in certain circumstances. So these are the circumstances where if it was just one male forcing himself on the female she may just want to accept even if he's lower quality if she can use her her cryptic female choice capabilities to reject his sperm later on. When there are multiple males ganging up on the female like this, though, there's, there's limited things that she can do. All right, well, let's, I, I've, I've mentioned some of these mating systems already, but let's go into a little more detail of the, the definitions of the mating systems. The most common one in birds is monogamy. And again, this is a social pair bond between one male and one female for at least one nesting attempt. But sometimes they will keep it together for a season if they have multiple nests in a season. And some species will actually uh, be monogamous for life, particularly some longer lived species like many of the swans. Um, because they tend to become more efficient working as a couple uh, as they age. However, if they don't seem to do well one season, you typically will see, uh, even, maybe even after one nesting attempt, divorce. Uh, it's actually referred to that in the literature where one individual will abandon the other one in, in an attempt to get another mate. And again, monogamy, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. this social pair bond system is the most common mating system in birds, and it's uh, seen in up to at least 90% uh, of all avian species. Now, I've, I've hinted at the importance of extra pair copulations going on in these social pair bonds, and this allows us to distinguish the difference between true genetic monogamous species in which you don't see extra pair copulations. It tends to be relatively rare. Um, it, it's seen in some species like the Florida scrub jay, uh, documented here. But in something like a cardinal, we have social monogamy, but we do have relatively common extra pair copulations and fertilizations. Uh, so EPC and EPF are, are the um, abbreviations for these two terms. The, the reason we even refer to them differently is because of cryptic female choice, right? So she may be showing lots of extra pair copulation, but she may show uh, genetic monogamy with regard to fertilizations right so she may not show any EPFs even though she's showing EPCs so there's not a one-to-one -one, um, linkage between those two so as I mentioned there are relatively few of these true genetic monogamous species the Florida scrub jay is one red crossbills common loons uh, dove keys uh, are species that genetically have been tested and they tend to show uh, no extra pair copulations. 
most monogamous species do show at least some level of extra pair copulation, 11% um, on average, but you can see that ranges greatly in different species. Um, in some cases, I mean, the, the, the highest bar here is relatively low frequency of EPCs, mm -hmm. uh, but some species, uh, it can be up to almost 80%. So in those species, this is the, that species that's being represented there uh, are the fairy wrens. And fairy wrens, actually, a male at his nest tends to have fewer of his own paternity at his own nest than he will have at other nests in the neighborhood. It's a very bizarre mating system uh, in the fairy wrens. So extra pair copulation is really important in that species. So here's a species that does show social monogamy and extra pair copulations. Purple martins nest these, in these colonies. And older dominant males pick top nests. These are safer from predators that might uh, crawl up the pole like a snake. Uh, they're going to raid the nest lower down. And one of the things that makes that safer is if they actually attract subordinate males to join the colony. They'll actually occupy these lower nests so that it provides that kind of predator buffer. But there's another reason why the dominant males want to recruit the subordinate uh, lesser quality males. The females that end up mating to these subordinate males again will benefit by extra pair copulations with the top level penthouse uh, dominant males. Studies have shown that these subordinate males attempt to mate guard their their mates, but there is a relatively high rate of uh, extra pair fertilization. Uh, about 43 percent of the offspring are from uh, extra pair fertilizations, and again, the the dominant male is the one getting the lion's share of those extra pair fertilizations. So he benefits in two ways: getting uh, more quantity. Uh, in fitness, uh, but also by reducing his probability of, of losing uh, fitness uh, to a predator. Again, why would the females do extra pair copulation? I kind of hit on some of this earlier. Again, better genes, more genetic diversity, um, both uh, 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 among and within uh, the young, so uh, cross young if you're using different sperm. Um, maybe if you mate with a male that's very different from you, even within that young, again, you're getting better heterozygosity. So there could be multiple kind of scales at which you could get genetic benefits. And as I mentioned, maybe you're mated with a high quality male in many regards, but he does have some, some fertility issues. Um, and uh, blue tits have been shown with uh, EPC. If they do that, they tend to have lower... Uh, rates of uh, infertile eggs. And again, potential access to uh, uh, higher quality males territory and the resources that are there. And the last one, I didn't talk about this, it's relatively rare, but uh, there's the potential that the male that you mate with, if he gets a sense that maybe his female cheated on him and he has low paternity associated with that nest, but you mated with that male enough so that he, you convince him that he's got high paternity probability at your nest, he may actually swap over and start feeding uh, at your, your nest more than his old nest. Um, I've actually seen this one time in scrub jays that I studied in, in uh, uh, Kerrville, Texas. So I mentioned that there are different sexually selected traits that females can use even within a species in different geographic populations. So barn swallows in America pay more attention to the rust on the belly uh, as a sexually selected trait. So the rustier that belly, the higher quality of the individual. And that leads to pairing rules. So the, the, the higher quality males may be the higher quality females. But then it also determines the lower quality females mated with lower quality males if they're going to have extra pair copulations, who are they going to mate with? Well, these males with the, with the rest of your bellies. And so kind of like in the, the tail experiment where they cut off and they made larger tails, you can use makeup to enhance the males, to make them look rustier on their belly. 
um, and then sham treat some with other makeup that just that keeps them the, the same um, and then controls that you just don't mess with the color at all they really should have had a group here where they actually made males of the the similar natural quality more wimpier by kind of hiding their coloration doesn't appear that they did that in this study um, but but you clearly see that the enhanced male did get higher paternity uh, through the extra pair copulation route by having this enhancement and and again this is just because the females perceived them as higher quality based on this one trait everything else about them was the same but as I mentioned tail length is more important in, in other populations uh, in European populations uh, but the the rust on the belly is more important in North American populations so I did mention the uh, superb fairy wrens there's just extreme extra pair fertilizations that you see there it tends to be linked to another complexity associated with their mating system they uh, show a mating behavior or a, a social system called cooperative breeding and in cooperative breeding, a pair that are the breeders will uh, be helped by sometimes, typically what's referred to as non-breeding helpers that are, are helping to raise the, the young at that nest. But in, in the case of the uh, superb fairy wrens, the helpers do attempt to get extra pair copulations with the females and the, the greater the number of helpers the greater the mix of paternity at that nest because the helpers uh, tend to uh, uh, be males and the lower the paternity associated with the the dominant well the uh, the male that's the owner of, of that nest and one of the reasons that the females would want to have these extra pair copulations in this situation is this frees them on a reliance of the social mate to be the one taking care of the offspring by having more helpers that you've convinced them that they have at least some share of paternity at the nest they're more likely to help at that nest so this is kind of a weird type of cooperative breeding system it's uh, very different from some of the others that we'll talk about later in the semester. I would almost be to the extent that I would not call this cooperative breeding. I've published papers about kind of the definition of that, but that's that's an aside. For, for, for this purpose, just know that the more males that are associated with a nest, the greater the mix of paternity at that nest from the socially mated male uh, and the, the uh, other males in, in the, the group that are achieving extra pair copulations and fertilizations. As I mentioned, one of the things that males will attempt to do to reduce extra pair fertilizations it, with their uh, socially monogamous female is mate guarding. And in some species, males will lose more by gaining by attempting to gain extra per fertilizations and they are actually shown to do better by just staying at home really following their female around constantly to guarantee that she doesn't have extra per copulations and achieve extra per fertilizations with males so in, in these a bears uh, toeys during the females fertility period the male is constantly by her and will forcibly run away any other males that attempt extra pair copulations. And that has been shown to be effective in some species, uh, like the, the towhee there uh, in these Seychelles warblers. Uh, the, the males uh, guard their female during their fertility period, but they don't really worry about it after her fertility period. And at that point, they go off seeking extra pair copulations uh, once she's already laid her eggs and it doesn't matter if, if other males mate with her so if you look at figure a here you see that um, there are intrusions uh, into a territory and extra pair copulation attempts early on and the male's not really doing much about it but 
uh, during her fertility period, which is indicated by the, the region in kind of the brown here, this is where the male is really doing a lot of mate guarding. And look what that does. It reduces the intrusions in the territory and it reduces the number of uh, attempts and extra pair copulations that, that turn into extra pair fertilizations. Well, what they did is they tricked some of these birds by um, um, adding an egg so that the males thought, because in this species, I think the, the yeah, the, they only lay one egg. Um, it's, a, it's a very weird species on the Seychelles Island. And one or maybe two, but I think it's just one. So they lay this model egg to trick the male into thinking, oh, she's already laid her egg. I'm out of here. All right, good to go. But it really was her fur. oops, sorry. It really is her fertile period. And what, what you see is that when the male is not guarding during her fertile period, the intrusions are still high, EP attempts are high, and successful extra pair copulations are high. And so in, the, in those situations, those males that didn't mate guard, they lost paternity at their nest. Just because you tricked them into not mate guarding. So why do most birds practice monogamy? The most likely explanation for this, or the hypothesis that has the most support, is called the mate assistance hypothesis. And the idea here is that uh, shared parental care is the key to fitness for both males and females. They're trying to pass on as many copies of their genes as possible, and biparental care really is the link to this. Due to altricial development. Altricial development refers to the fact that in most birds the young are born in an altricial state meaning that they're blind, they're relatively underdeveloped, they're very helpless, they can't feed on their own, and they have incredibly fast developmental rates. So to keep up with that developmental rate you have to have a lot of food. And the only way that you can get enough food for a clutch of eggs is if both males and females work together to bring food to the nest and also to, to work together to guard the nest against predators. Basically, in, in these species, you're just not going to have much reproductive success if you try to go it alone. This also refers to uh, sharing incubation duties. So if you look at the European starlings, uh, when uh, both males and females are incubating, you see that um, the temperature tends to uh, not vary as much and be maintained at a, a fairly constant uh, optimal temperature. And when a female is doing it by herself, boy, she just can't do that. The temperature tends to drop on average and, and have a much wider range. And uh, there are maximum and uh, critical, maximum and critical minimum temperatures in which those eggs would actually uh, die. And even if they're not going to die, they can have some developmental problems uh, um, associated with developing at lower temperatures. So there's this by having biparental care uh, and sharing incubation duties uh, that can also be beneficial.